I want people to laugh. One, it's a stand-up special. <laughs> but I also want people to learn more about me. So first, I want to congratulate you on your new special. Thank you so uh, much. I would like to ask you, why call it the first woman? I think you'll understand more once you watch the special, but I wanted to give it a name that kind of encompassed the themes in the special, which are very woman forward. Mm -hmm. I talk about myself as a woman, as a black woman. Uh, I talk about women's anatomy. I talk about women's history in America. So it, it, there's a lot of like themes in there that connect. And I felt like the first woman really encapsulated that. Yeah. And I did watch it and I felt like you wove those themes really expertly throughout the special. So it was a pleasure to see that. Um, okay. But in the special, you talked openly about how you discovered you had anxiety when you discovered you had heart palpitations and there, and that's incredibly relatable, but how is it for you to learn that about yourself and then talk about that in the special in such an open way? It feels kind of cathartic. Honestly, once I kind of had a name to what was happening to my body and my personhood, it felt nice. It felt nice to like know, oh, okay, I, this is what's happening. Like as opposed to like, I'm dying or like what's happening when these palpitations are going on. It's like, oh, I'm maybe having an anxious moment and I can just analyze it as it's happening. And so also saying it out loud felt really nice. And also people are relating to it and kind of makes me feel like it's not such a mystery anymore. And right. yeah, I, I hope people like hear it and analyze their own bodies or try to think about like what else is going on in their lives because I could have just been like, I don't know, my heart's weird and that not addressed it. Mm -hmm. And now I, now I know, oh, okay. I think there's something else going on here. Right. And within like the black community, I know it's very hard for people to, to go get mental health, you know, related checks and, and speak to, to doctors about that thing. Did you have any type of hesitancy about doing that or did you grow Definitely. up with that at all? Yeah. I, yeah, I think I had people in my family who didn't understand therapy or didn't necessarily think that if you had a mental health issue, it was something that needed to be addressed. And then when it came to like figuring out what was going on, I specifically looked for a black woman doctor to check out my heart because I had had experiences with medical professionals where they didn't listen to me or didn't know what was going on or didn't know how to address what was happening or people in my family, like my mom was going through stuff where doctors just like straight up didn't listen to her or like address the pain she was feeling. So I thought, oh, let me go to a black woman because she might understand what's happening more or like at least listen to me more. And it did work, <laughs> which like <laughs> sucks because it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't, I shouldn't have to, you know, sift through doctors to find one who looks like me in order to get the correct care. But unfortunately, we're still in a moment where not all doctors understand every body. <laughs> so mm -hmm. hopefully we get to a point where that isn't the case. And I, I hope by talking about this in the special, people talk about it in their own lives, in their own community, and maybe more awareness of it gets us to a place where there's more action to change it quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you did talk about that a lot when, when you were discussing your uh, car accident mm -hmm. and your experience going to the hospital and, and everything. Could you elaborate a little bit on that as far as like what happened and and just maybe the aftermath of that? You didn't didn't really go into that a lot in the special, but yeah. did that kind of transform like at that point when it, after it happened, did you think, OK, this changes the way, you know, I approach health related issues and, mm -hmm. and medical issues from this point forward? Yeah, yeah. I, I got hit by a car at UVA and mm -hmm. I got taken to the hospital and 
there were people around me. There were people who worked there who were aware of what was happening, kind of. Like there was a nurse who was like, you know, what are you in for? And I was like, I got hit by a car. Pretty sure nothing's broken, but like I just have a lot of pain. And he was like, oh, okay. Well, we can't give you any painkillers because we have to wait for the doctor to assess you because we don't know what's broken on you, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to get an x-ray for my head and they made me stand. It was like a whole ordeal. People were just kind of like not taking my accident, my car accident, <laughs> seriously. And I, at the beginning when I got there, I was kind of like, I just want some ice and some painkillers because I know nothing's broken. And I was there for seven hours. And then by the time the doctor finally came and saw me, she was like, oh yeah, nothing's broken. We honestly could have given you some painkillers and some ice when you first got here and you would have been gone seven hours ago. <laughs> and yeah, it's just moments like that where I, I thought that that was just like a bad experience, but I didn't know what exactly was happening until years later when I was like, oh, this is like a pattern. This is like something that happens to a lot of black people, a lot of black women, a lot of women in general, where doctors don't necessarily pay attention to what you're saying. And uh, and not, and that's not always the case, but the, it can be often the case, and especially for Black women. And I and I've had people tweet to me after watching my special, being like, "I'm a white lady, and I was in the hospital for something that way less than a car accident, and I got opioids immediately." You know, like it's like mm -hmm. unfair the disparity and how they distribute painkillers or aid because of who knows, whatever pre preconceived notions they have. Maybe they think that you're going to like abuse the drugs or or they think it's an easy fix for white people, but black people can tolerate more pain, which is something that's mm -hmm. still written in medical books <laughs> at school. Yeah, so that is, I, I do keep that in mind because I don't want to be in another situation like that. But yeah, I'm just hoping that more people are aware of this stuff and, and try to change it. Okay. And you mentioned that you didn't really think about it until years later. You do mm -hmm. mention earlier in the special how you kind of imply like being in your 30s that there's stuff that you look back on in your 20s, such as going out with your girlfriend for drinks by yourself, you know, and how you would never have done that in your 20s. And you, you have a different perspective now. And is there anything in your 20s specifically other than that that you would look back on and and maybe was judge yourself for doing or being like you shouldn't have been worrying so much about that or mm. you know as a 30 year old you have more perspective on yeah i mean the the point of the joke was kind of like i i was scammed a lot in my 20s or like duped i was so green i moved to new mm. york knowing nothing <laughs> and <laughs> people took advantage but I wouldn't change a thing because it made me who I am today. Like it, I feel like I developed a lot of uh, knowledge and skill at sussing out scams. So like mm -hmm. because I have been got <laughs> because I got got so many times, I can I know how to handle it when it happens today. So yeah, it's kind of like I like getting older. I like growing and gaining more knowledge from experiences and i think it's like i think it's like funny to think about the things that you went through in your 20s but i don't think i would change what happened because it was necessary to get me to where i am now okay and you said you lived in brooklyn new york for 10 years was that in brooklyn or different places in new york in different places in new york in different places in new york how did your career kind of developed from there was it or at that time did you know that comedy was something that you wanted to do or were you dabbling in other things i moved to new york in 2009 and i thought i was going to do broadway i was like auditioning for plays and musicals and stuff but i kept going to see comedy at the upright citizens brigade theater and I loved improv and sketch and stand up and I was just a fan and I had done improv in college and then moved to New York and was still like seeing it and then eventually was like I should take classes I love this like this feels like like where I belong and quickly took classes took sketch classes was going to stand up open mics and then just kind of fell in love with it and, and eventually started realizing that like 
the people I looked up to on SNL and Mad TV and Who's On Is It Anyway were coming from backgrounds like this. And that's when I started realizing, oh, I think I want to do comedy. I think this is like the traction I want to to follow. And I got representation because like my manager saw me on stage. My agent saw me on stage. I started booking, booking commercials. I started booking little bit parts on TV shows. So it kind of started rolling one thing into another and yeah, kind of made a career out of it. That's great. Another thing you mentioned in your special was during COVID that you shaved your head and Mm -hmm. the height of the pandemic was a period of transformation for many people. Was there anything specific behind it or you just felt one day you just wanted to change your hairstyle or? I I've shaved my head like this when I was 19 and, Mm -hmm. and loved it. And then grew out my hair and like grew out my fro. And that was like the beginning of my natural journey and kind of like every summer for the last few years, I just want to shave it all off again. <laughs> I was like, gosh, get it off. But I didn't, you know, I wouldn't because like maybe I need my hair for a job or like maybe I need enough hair to put braids in it or something. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I like literally had COVID. <laughs> I don't know if it was like being isolated or what, but I was just like in my house by myself. And I was like, well, I mean, if I shave it and I hate it, I'm still isolating for a few more days. So maybe it'll just... <laughs> I just, I'll just grow it back in and it'll be fine eventually. And so, yeah, I just shaved it off and it felt really good. And I've, I'm kind of like, oh, why isn't it always like this? Because it just <laughs> takes less time to get ready. It's mm-hmm. very freeing. Yeah, you can see more of my face. I I love it. I, it, I guess it did feel like part of my transformational journey during COVID or during the pandemic as we all were going through. But yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a nice physical change that I did myself. <laughs> and another thing I would like to get your opinion on that you mentioned in the special, you did this whole thing after you're talking about your issues with, with doctors and, and your experiences. And you're saying that we should probably make illness cool because people aren't afraid to listen to Black people and take from Black people when it's cool. And that made me think about the issues of cultural appropriation and there's a discussion of how much has been taken and what little is given back to the community. Do you have specific thoughts on that? Or was that just something that you, you, you know, when you're coming up with a joke, you say, oh, that, that would be great for this. Or is this an issue that you specifically think about, especially within entertainment? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's people are constantly thinking about cultural appropriation and, and how rampant it is. And yeah, I think I just kind of wanted to like tool around with that in this joke where I was talking about, you know, ailments that black people might have and like the idea of like, well, if people are going to take things for black people anyway, they may as well take our illness (laughs) as well take the sickness since we're such trendsetters take sickle cell. We don't want it. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I think it was just like a fun way to illuminate many things in one joke. Um, But yeah, it's everyone's aware of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Also, you had your running joke of witches in your special. Mm -hmm. What is behind the fascination with them other than they're awesome? They are awesome. I don't know. I think I I just been like reading up on witches. I think, you know, we're in a time where people are feeling very witchy or doing like little (laughs) everyday magic things in their own life. And I, I kind of started seeing a lot of themes and the reading I was doing that witches were kind of just like unruly women or women who couldn't be tamed or people in general. And I kind of wanted to talk about it in the show because I didn't want witch to be like a dirty word or like a, a bad connotation and kind of give some light to the history of how we even got to our perception of what a witch is and why why we might think about that and why maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing and yeah i and i i I hope people watch the special and come away with it with a different idea of witchery and you know kind of look forward to the magic as opposed to being scared of it you have so much history in your show by the way i love that let me move on to your aclu work 
as a celebrity ambassador. In a New York Times article from 2019, they mentioned that you didn't think of yourself as a political comedian. With you being an ambassador of the Women's Rights Project, do you still see yourself that way? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I still think people call me a political comedian. And I do a lot of work for social justice things. That That's my personal life. It's not necessarily my comedy. But yeah, I guess I don't talk about politics in the sense of like the government or whatever. But I do talk about things that are personal to me, which are like being a woman or being a mm-hmm. black woman in America. And that can inherently be political, uh, which I don't mind. I don't I, I don't actually mind anyone calling me a political comedian. I don't actively try to be, but I do think people hear the topics I talk about or see the work that I do with the ACLU or Planned Parenthood or any other organization that works for, you know, giving rights to all people and think, oh yeah, she she aligns politically with whatever. But I'm also sometimes just a silly clown who does stand up and jokes. <laughs> what do you see as the most important causes within that sphere right now? The, uh, within what? within women's rights, is there anything in particular that that you see as something that we really need to kind of focus on, or just you know kind of promote and create awareness for? I mean, the overturning of Roe is a huge one. And I I filmed this special in D.C. last year when a mm-hmm. lot of that talk was happening. And it kind of felt really good to be like talking about my, my anatomy and mm-hmm. my reproductive parts and blood and whatever and have people in the audience also talk about their parts too in dc and yeah it, it just uh, is a moment where we need to like try to think about how we can get access to health care for everybody and and try our best to like find resources for people because they keep getting stripped away mm-hmm. which is unfortunate it's not not a great time for being a woman right now <laughs> and what do you want people to other than the issues with with women's rights and being comfortable with your body and being comfortable with yourself as a woman, is there anything in specific that you want people to take from this special after they see it and be like, wow, you know, I didn't really think of that before I saw saw this? I want people to laugh, one. It's a stand-up <laughs> special. But I also want people to learn more about me this is the second special I released. The first one I put out was in 2017 and it was like five years later and the world has changed a bunch. I've changed a bunch and I hope people see this and get more of an idea of what my voice is today. <laughs>